Hi guys, I've got another kit build for you today. Uh, this is another clock kit. Um, it's different from the last one I've done a, a couple of videos ago. Uh, this one is a dot matrix display. So it's got these LED panels. I, I believe they're 8x8 eight eight LEDs. Um, if you can see that there. Um, so this one's from Banggood this time and it cost me uh, about $13.60 Australian dollars which is just over 10 bucks USD and this one apparently has um, a few of the same features it's got an alarm it's got a temperature display and a dimming mode apparently so when you um, turn the lights off it has a some sort of LDR or light sensor it'll dim the lights um, I got the red one um, it's got a red dot in the packet and you can see on the back here, I'll zoom you in, there's some uh, details there, it says red and it's got an SKU there as well, which you might be able to Google. Uh, but I'll, I'll leave the links to the Banggood uh, product page uh, below anyways, so you'll be able to find that. Um, another thing that they've said here is that it's got um, a, a memory mode, well not a memory mode, uh, like a real-time clock of some sort, so that if you disconnect the power, this is 5 volt, it's got a little USB cable. If you disconnect the power, it'll uh, remember the time or, or keep keep counting time, so you, you don't have to reset it every time. Um, so I guess we'll just take this out of the packet and see exactly what we got. It's a little bit concerning when they just throw all of the parts, including the microcontroller and sensitive parts, in these plastic baggies because they're terrible for static. Uh, and actually on the product page, I noticed they had in red text, it's like, hey, people have been complaining that these things aren't working properly, and they actually mentioned that there's a static issue because they're not soldering it correctly. I call bullshit on that. I think it's because they're not packaging it correctly. Uh, it can't be that much more expensive to um, put these things in the proper, um, you know, static safe bags, but I don't know. Every cent counts, I guess. Um, here's the instructions, all in English. We've got a nice bomb there. Uh, bill of materials. Tells us all the parts that we expect to find. The welding installation considerations follow these steps. I think they mean soldering. So basically, they're saying to follow the parts um, on the silk screen. Um, and they've got some settings here for actually setting the clock and, and doing that. And a couple of pictures of the finished product. Um, so that should come in handy. We'll just put that back there at the back of the desk. Um, we'll see exactly what we've got here. So we've got these three uh, LED displays. I'll zoom you in so you can see these parts a bit better. So we've got these three LED panels. And as you can see, it's just a, an array of LEDs and a bunch of pins there. So that would, <clears throat> that would be mapped to the anode and cathode of each LED. And by switching voltage through each of these pins, you'll be able to light up each of the LEDs independently. Um, so that's what this microcontroller would be doing. It would be switching through really quickly um, and displaying those, those LEDs one at a time. But it will be fast enough that with the persistence of vision, it will it'll look like a display. Uh, we've got our little USB cable. It's just a USB to a DC jack. So that's 5 volts supply. Uh, we've got our laser cut plastic enclosure here and looks like the PCB is sandwiched in the middle. Let's unwrap all of that. So we've got all our little parts here to make up the enclosure which is good and there's our PCB it's this nice yellow colour um, and that's actually pretty fine pitch, it's a good quality PCB by the looks of it. And we can just follow the silk screen. It's got the um, part designators there for each of the components. So by following that we should be able to um, find out where we put all the parts. But it looks like there's not a hell of a lot of parts anyways. Um, let's just break this one open. So there's our chip, it's an STC microcontroller. Um, no surprises there, a lot of these Chinese little kits and Chinese electronics come with these STC microcontrollers. So we've got some surface mount capacitors and a bunch of other bits. So there's a bunch of mounting hardware, um, there's some resistors, these little resistors, uh, tactile switch, that's a right angle tactile switch. 
through hole and a little electrolyte capacitor and there's our LDR which is doing our light sensing um, what's that another little chip that's probably our real-time clock I'm just gonna have a quick look at that yeah it's a DS 1302Z so that's a very common real-time clock chip so that's keeping the time when the when the main power is not plugged in um, and I guess it's they're just running that off the electrolytic capacitor because there's no other battery included. Um, I'm assuming that's what they do. So maybe, oh no, sorry. There is a battery. There it is. And there's a little battery holder. So you see I've got my Hakko FX Triple Eight D soldering iron here, which is a really good beginner soldering iron. I think it's about a hundred bucks or so. Really good iron. Um, the tips are really good. Make sure you get the proper Hakko ones because I've tried some cheaper Chinese ones and they're, they're junk. If you get a decent hacko tip on that, um, yeah, it's really good. It's really fast heat up time and it's um, really nice iron. Um, I've also over here, I've got the Aten 858D Plus, which is my little hot air rework station. And this again is a really good one, especially if you're starting out, you don't want to spend a million bucks. This one has the air supplied through the handle here. There's actually a little fan in here that blows out through the nozzle. Um, you might see on some other hot air stations, they'll have it it's like a really thick pipe coming in here and there's an air pump in the in the head unit but in this one it's, it's in the handle and it works quite well um, I usually keep the smallest nozzle on I doubt we're going to be using this one today though because generally um, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to, to get set up for hot air um, especially for installing such a small kit like this it's generally much easier just to use a soldering iron and these SMD parts um, I mean, they're only like 0805s, they're not that small, so it's it's quite comfortably done with a soldering iron once you get um, some practice at that. Um, but this is really good for if you need to repair a board or rework a board and you need to heat up all the pads at the same time to remove a chip or something, that's when you need hot air guns. Um, and also if you're doing like a bigger board or, or, or like a batch of boards and you can get set up and, and it's a little bit easier then um, to use a hot air gun. Uh, but today, I think we're just going to use the Hakko and I'll show you how we go through putting this thing together and then uh, we'll go from there. So let's just make sure we've got all the parts we need here. Just get everything out of the bags. I might just leave those capacitors for a sec. Um, we won't need this enclosure till later so I'll get all these little laser cut bits of plastic out of the way. These are probably going to go on last um, so we'll concentrate on surface mount I reckon. We'll put all the surface mount stuff on first um, then we can move to the through hole bits and pieces. So at the end of the day there's not a lot of surface mount really, there's sort of through hole, surface mount. And I think we'll put the chip on first. I want to get you a close up of this just so you can see what I'm looking to do. So this chip here, see one of the legs here has got a bit of a corner on it. That designates pin 1. And on the chip we'll have a marking on pin 1 and it might be this little divot. See this chip has a little divot in the corner so that correlates to that marking. So it basically sit on the board like that. Just like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in with a soldering iron. I'll just tack one of the pins down and make sure it's straight and then tack an opposite pin down so we get it locked in. And then we can go through and solder all those pins and you can just basically brush it with a soldering iron and, and it'll solder on. You don't need a lot of solder at all for surface mount parts like this. Just, just a little bit will do, so zoom you back out and we'll get going on that. Just while the soldering iron is warming up there, I'll just show you, when I'm doing surface mount, I've got a bunch of different tweezers and things here. Some of them are junk. If you find ones like this, that have that sort of like rounded end on them, let me zoom you in. These are trash. They're like cosmetic tweezers or something, but sometimes you'll find them sold for the surface mount. Get rid of them, no good. Um, what I generally use, you can get all sorts of types, so you can see this one here has like these funny little pads on it. Focus, you see that one's got little little tips on it for holding components. I generally find that these aren't as handy as you might think they are. I've used these a couple of times. Um, I don't really like them because you find the more you solder with the tweezers, they, they tend to gum up a little bit with flux and solder residue, and that's just more surface area for things to stick to the tweezers. So generally, I'll use something like a really fine tip like that, like pointy tips, um, or like like these, same sort of thing, just like a real fine tip I like. 
but my favorite would have to be tweezers that have a slight bend on them. I don't like a sharp 90 degree angle, but if you can get ones with a slight bend, I'll just take the cover off of those. You can see these are a little bit beat up, um, but that's perfect because they sort of, they give you that nice angle to solder on. I find that generally if I'm doing really small parts with tweezers like this, they tend to lay on the PCB too much. It gets a little bit difficult, but if you've got tweezers like this, um, you can get the part on the board and, you, and you're not leaning all over the board. Uh, so it's, yeah, it's a lot nicer. So, uh, I mean, it's all preference, but these are my personal favorite. It's just a slight curve on the end of the tweezers like that. So I'll be going with those today. And we'll clear off these other ones. Other ones do come in handy, so it's, it's nice to have a, a decent little con collection uh, for different things, but I generally stick to these. All right, soldering iron's hot. We'll give it a bit of a clean. And we'll go for it. It's a little bit difficult for me because I'm sitting back to give you guys some space for this camera. So I'm sort of soldering from a distance. It's a little bit clumsy from this far away, but we just need a, bit, a little bit of solder on that pad. And then I'm going to move this out of camera view so I can line it up. So we want to line up all these feet. So I've just tacked this corner up here and it's enough that I can still sort of move the chip a little bit just to line it up. And now I'm going to do the opposite pin. Just put a little bit of solder on there. And we should be able to just... tack that one down to the board. So it's nice and sturdy now. Uh, and then we can run solder down all these pins. There's a few ways you can do it. You can drag solder. Uh, generally good if you've got some uh, flux to help out with that. Um, I'm just going to try and brush it, so what I'm going to do is just use a little bit of solder and just sort of like brush it away from the chip along the pins and uh, hopefully we get a decent solder joint there. Alright, I'm just having a little bit of trouble with the solder flowing through these legs here, so I might actually get that gel flux. Um, so if you have any issues with solder, sort of get it. Oftentimes, if you, if you spend too long with the solder on the tip of the iron and working the joint, you'll find that the flux burns out. That's what all the smoke is, and when that burns away, you're left with just the the metal, and it gets quite brittle and difficult to to get a decent stick. Um, so sometimes it's good to have some flux. This is just some Chemtools um, NC two five four flux gel. It's way out of date, but it'll be all right. Um, so I'm just going to put a little bit of this around the chip and then we'll uh, continue on. And that, hopefully that helps a little bit. Okay, I had to sort of do that off camera because I couldn't get close enough to it to see what I was doing. But if you have a look now, hopefully you can see that we've got um, a decent solder joint in all of those legs there. So I've ended up sort of putting a bunch of flux on and then just brushing the solder along the leads to spread out some solder. Try and get that to focus. So brushing along and then at the end I just sort of like pull down like this and just make sure that there's no uh, shorts in between the legs. And that's one side done. So I'm going to go and do the rest of the sides. Um, apologies for not getting decent video on this. It's quite difficult um, to sit back so far with the cameras and, and film this. So put a bunch of flux on here. You can always wash it off later, as I said. A ton of it. It's probably too much, but um, Lewis Rosman would approve. Just sort of drag that blob of solder all the way down the pins then and i think i did all right let me just have a quick look maybe just give it a little touch up at the end here 
just to be sure. Yep, that looks good. So I'll do the last side now, same thing. Trump to go too crazy with the flux this time, but still want a nice bead across there. Just a little blob of salt, there we go. We'll just start working that. I'm just sort of nudging it down the pins. Just dragging it along. The reason I'm doing, I'm, I'm taking so long and only using a little bit of solder is because I don't have any solder wick. So by doing it this way, it takes a little bit longer just nudging along, but you can see we still get the result we're after. And we use barely any solder. So let me just have a quick look at that one. Just tidy up this end. Yep, that's good. So there's our chip soldered. Um, so we'll move on to the other uh, surface mount parts. Uh, I think we'll chuck this little chip in now, the little um, the little real time clock. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to tin one of the pins here, pin eight, a little blob of solder on it like that. Now if we get our chip, this is how it should have come by the way, see it's in its anti-static little piece of tape, that's, that's a piece of cut tape, it's usually on a big, big roll, um, but that'll help with the static, unlike how this one was packaged in its baggie. So I don't know if you can see this, I'm just going to carefully just rip the top of that off and we should get our chip. So if you look at the silk screen, there's that little cup here at the top of the chip. That is the, the top, which means this pin here is pin one. So if you look at the chip, you see it's got a little divot that designates pin one. So we're going to solder pin eight. So it goes one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So let me just make sure my iron's clean. I'm grab this chip and what I usually do is just like make sure we've got a good melt on that and then slide it into place. So that's in place and all our pins are lined up. You can probably nudge it a little bit this direction. There we go. And now I'll go around and solder the rest. And there's no need to drag solder this. These pin, the pin pitch is so big on this that I can literally just solder it like a normal part. I'm just sort of like just taking a little little tiny bit of solder off with each little brush and that puts the pin down there. Go along on this side. These aren't perfectly aligned but it's, it's no worries, just make sure we don't bridge it like that and we're good. That's it, done. So we'll keep moving on. Um, I'm now going to do uh, the resistors I think and then we'll do capacitors and then we'll do the through hole parts. So I'm going to move this camera back out, zoom you out a bit and then that'll give me some space to get this board done. But I think that's probably the most interesting part is getting um, these chips on. And that's probably what, what a lot of people would struggle with is particularly this chip. Um, if you just take your time and just sort of work that bead across all the pins, um, get yourself some flux. And I, I like gel flux, it's the nicest stuff to apply. And uh, yeah, you're set. So let me continue on and we'll come back later. So looking at our instructions, R123, is a 10k resistor and looks like that's the only resistor except for the thermistor here which is an NTC but that's a through hole part uh, yeah so we got to worry about is putting them in the right footprint but they're um, it's all the same resistor uh, so they've given us uh, okay so these are another set of capacitors they've given us a ton of resistors here I mean they, they work they cost nothing so we just need three of them. You just want to get your tweezers and just grab the edge of that tape and then start it peeling. See one just popped out. Peel that back. So we'll just tip out three. Keep the two on the tape. Um, and if you look, these are, because these are quite large parts um, as far as SMD goes. I mean, they look tiny. It's hard to film and things. And uh, if, you, if you're new to doing SMT, uh, SMT or SMD, 
these are they feel like they're small but they're, they're actually really not that bad um, I think I've soldered hand soldered for prototypes down to 0402 which is about half the size of these or actually more like a quarter of the size of these um, so we'll get these in now it's the same process with resistors like this I'm not going to zoom you in too far but you see these pads here one two and three See just above the real-time clock chip, we've got one, two, three. So I'm going to I'm going to tin, put a blob of solder on one of each of these. Then we'll position the component, melt the solder down to pin it down, and then do the other side. And that's basically it. it's quite simple. So I'll get into that now. You don't need a lot of solder at all. Just a little bit like that. So for cleaning all the flux off the board, I usually use Kim wipes and 99.9% .9 isopropyl. Um, and I usually put this in little plunger bottles, but you can also get it in um, these little spray pack things or something like that. Um, this is the only one I can find at the moment instead of going for the stupid big bottle. But what I usually do, this stuff evaporates nicely, so you can just sort of go crazy with it. And I usually get a little ESD brush like this, got a bunch of little different sizes, and you just sort of like get all that flux to melt. It's still on the board there, but we're just sort of using the um, the isopropyl as a solvent. Just make sure we get all in there, and then I get the Kim wipe and just use it to absorb like this. Maybe you can see that. We use a brush from the top like this. And you can see it's all yellow there. It's picking up all the flux. Peel it off. I find this is the best way. If you try and rub it, you end up with bits of paper all over the place. You see how yellow that is? That's all that flux coming off the board. So this is what I find is the best way to do it. Stick it down, you can also saturate the top there and then just like pat it down with the brush and get it all around the pins. Um, this is much better than using a tissue, they're stronger, they don't tear and like munch apart and put crap everywhere um, and they're not as heavy as a paper towel so they're, they're really the best thing to use but you could use something else, I mean you know, you need to get the Kim wipes but I just find they're the nicest thing. Um, I just grab those ones off Amazon I think. Let's do one more. Let's do a final rinse. See, we took all the numbers off the LEDs. Yeah, just be careful of that actually, like this stuff, this isopropyl is really pretty powerful stuff depending on the chemicals it's used on, all the inks and dyes. Usually if you use like a nickel or a permanent marker, it'll just strip it straight off um, and stickers and things, so just be careful of that. But generally, uh, most electronics 
Um, you know, it's a very common cleaning chemical, so you, you're generally right for electronics and things. So I'll just let that evaporate for a bit. There's still a little bit of residual isopropyl. We'll let that dry, and then we'll um, come back and plug in the power and test the clock out. So this is all nicely cleaned and dried off. Um, so moment of truth. What I've done is I've taken the cable and just put in a little USB charger. That'll give us our uh, 5 volts that we need. So we'll plug that in. And we'll plug this in. And fingers crossed. Alright, I'll turn this light off so you can see that. There we go. Let's kill all the lights actually. comes up with love hearts <laughs> and then it switches to the time so I haven't put the battery in here for the um, real-time clock yet but I'll just see if this does temperature I just want to see if that works there we go 50 degrees C so I think there's something wrong with that because that shouldn't be 50 degrees C that sounds like it's maxed out so it's not reading this the mister correctly um, so We'll turn the lights back on, and we are now in troubleshooting mode. Let me just unplug this. Okay. So I'll zoom you in. I've got a suspicion about this. Uh, let me get something to point with. So as you see here, we've got this thermistor. Now, it's an NTC, meaning a negative temperature coefficient, which means that as the temperature rises, the... Uh, resistance drops um, but I think we've got an issue here because the leads from this resistor come down so this is why, this is why I wasn't sure about these resistors here because there's a R9 and an R8 which aren't listed on the bill of materials but if this is an NTC, then generally that'll be like a voltage divider. So you need another resistor that this uses to divide the um, supply of 5 volts, whatever it is, and then it will change the voltage up and down that this chip can then read as an analog input voltage. So maybe it's one of these, right? Maybe it's that's what it is. That could be it. Or maybe this resistor here does actually need to be populated. Yeah, so I think this resistor needs to be here, and I think so does this one for this LDR as well. It'll be a similar thing. It'll be like a, um, a voltage divider. Um, and we've actually got some of the resistors. So I'm going to stick a resistor in there. I'll stick one in there as well. And there's actually another resistor here. That would be for this PZO beeper as well. So it looks like these three resistors are actually required. Um, it's a bit strange they don't have them written on the bill of materials or on the instructions at all but you know can't expect everything so I'm going to stick them on now quickly and then we'll fire this thing back up again and see if it fixes our, our circuit it should be good okay so let's plug this back in Kill the lights. Okay, our beep is working now. That's really annoying. <laughs> okay, so we'll just wait for the, um, let's zoom you out a little bit, and we'll wait for the temperature. Okay, there we go. So we've got a decent temperature now. So that's now working. Our buzz is working. And I'm assuming that this little light sensor, for turn the light on over here, No, I'm not sure how that works. It might have a delay in it of some sort, um, but I'm assuming that's that's going to be okay now. Um, so I'm sorry for the washed out light, but we're going to unplug that. We'll put our little battery in. So this should then retain the time after we've um, disconnected power. It'll keep the real time clock and its little uh, watch crystal there running. So we'll just pop that in like that. I'm going to put the enclosure together. We'll get this thing boxed up. This isn't that, that exciting. I'm just going to have to peel all the plastic or the um, paper off the plastic, and then it's just these nuts and bolts. Um, but I'll put this together now, and then uh, I'll run through some of the functions in a second.
there it is. That's really nice. I really like that enclosure too. Keep the dust off of everything. And a little thermistor's poking out the top there. Probably need to be that high, but it's all right. It's on the top. It's not getting in the way. And there it is. So I'm just quickly having a look at these instructions. Yeah, this is all pretty horrible. I think we've just got to use it and figure it out. So it's got these two buttons. The bottom one is to set the time and the alarm. And then the top one, you can see it turns these things on and off. I'm not really sure exactly. I think that might be the hourly chime and the alarm or something. Uh, and then if you let it sit there, it will... Um, it will go through time and temperature, it'll just sort of scroll across. Um, but that's a really neat little device, it's, it's quite small, it's quite compact which is good. So we're talking uh, 10 centimetres roughly by 4 centimetres by 2.5 centimetres. Um, yeah, it's really neat, I really like that one. So very cool. Thanks again for watching guys, um, see you in another video. Cheers.